Hi Year 6, uh, back again for chapter, uh, chapter 15, Turning the Tide. Hurrying through the harbour, I had to dodge more people, paint pots, ladders than I could count. I'd left Cliff on the beach playing with Pixie after what Ephraim had just told me. I needed a moment to myself. Could he have been the man Suki met that night? Ephraim and my sister? I pictured the letters inside those chocolate boxes in Suki's drawer. Maybe there was something romantic between them, despite what Mrs Henderson said about Ephraim wanting to be alone. Yet in my mind, the code looked practical, to the point. Besides, the man I'd seen Suki with was tall and blonde and smartly dressed. Ephraim was none of these things. He'd been writing to my sister, though, and she'd written back long, detailed letters that had kept her busy in her room most nights. I wondered what they talked about, what they had in common. But I was beginning to realise there was plenty about my sister I didn't understand. Head down against the wind, I walked faster. Now that Ephraim had trusted me with his message to Queenie, perhaps I should trust him too. He'd been in contact with Suki, hadn't he? So he must know something. I made my mind up. It was time to share the code with someone who might be able to break it. I'd ask Ephraim as soon as I got back. The post office was busy. What I'd not considered was the prospect of running into Esther, who was serving behind the counter. I bet she'd not forgotten the ink can accident, even if I momentarily had. Joining the queue, I fidgeted nervously. Esther, I could see, was wearing the same brown apron Cliff had worn, only it actually fitted her. She served the woman in front with a politeness I didn't expect, which made me hope she might at least be civil to me. There's your coupons back, Mrs Saunders, she said, sliding a ration book across the counter. Sorry about that. We'll let you know when more biscuits come in. Never known it happened before, the woman complained, glaring at me as if it was my fault all the biscuits had been sold. Seeing I was next, Esther's expression changed. I'm not speaking to you, she said, staring over my head. My heart gave a disappointed thump. I've not come to make trouble. I'm here for Queenie. I glanced behind her at the door that connected to the rest of the house. I'd wanted to say something else, something kinder, but felt suddenly stupidly tongue-tied. Esther folded her arms like she wasn't going to move out of my way. Underneath the hard stare, she looked tired. This was the bluster Queenie had mentioned, wasn't it? The tough act under which was another nicer girl. I just needed to give her a chance. The trouble was, every time I tried, I seemed to get it wrong. The shop bell jangled as another customer came in. Esther, moving back behind the counter, finally jerked her head towards the door. You know where Queenie is, she muttered. Same place as always. The cellar door was ajar. I knocked, but hearing no reply, straightened my shoulders and went down the steps. Olive! Queenie blinked. Whatever, she, whatever she'd been doing, she'd stopped it abruptly. You could almost sense the room holding its breath. It was strange to think that just above our heads, the post office customers were being served as normal. Yet down here felt a different world, shadowy, secretive, and I had a thrilling sense that I'd crossed over into it. I gave Queenie the envelope. This is from Ephraim. Eyebrows raised in surprise, she looked at me, then the letter, then me again. I was good at delivering, quick, reliable, and Queenie knew it. I wanted her to know that Ephraim trusted me too. He said to bring it straight away. She didn't bother with the letter opener, ripping, it, ripping the seal with her fingernails. I wondered if I was supposed to wait for a reply. The cellar was messier than last time I'd been here. It felt busier too, as if all sorts of urgent things had been going on and the buzz still hung in the air. Documents on headed notepaper lay spread across the table. Others, marked with crosses, spilled out of a box on the floor. None of it looked like post office business to me. The table was heaped with weather charts and lists of tide times as if she was planning a boat trip. Queenie took her time reading a frame's note. My hands fidgeted in my coat pockets as I waited. I couldn't stop looking around me either. If Queenie noticed, she made no attempt today to block my view. A tray of dirty tea things sat forgotten about on the floor. There were more chairs than normal, all evidence of yesterday's meeting. One teacup, I noticed, had lipstick on its rim, the same glossy red colour that Miss Carter wore. 
If Frame had mentioned the others, it didn't take much guessing to work out who they were. When it came to welcoming strangers to Budmouth Point, Miss Carter and Mrs Henderson had experience. First evacuees, now refugees. That was it, wasn't it? There were people in Europe fleeing for their lives who were escaping here to Budmouth Point. These were the visitors Ephraim was expecting. The realisation made me dizzy. It connected to Suki, didn't it? Because she'd cried telling... She'd cried trying to tell me how heartbreaking it was not being able to help. Yet in writing to Ephraim, maybe she'd found a way to. Perhaps their letters were actually full of plans of how they might get people away from the Nazis. It would certainly explain why Suki wrote so much and so often. Bit by bit, I could feel it coming together in my head. That map with the foreign place names I'd found in her drawer at home. Was this where the boat was coming from? Are you all right? Queenie asked suddenly. Looking concerned, she offered me a chair. I'm fine. I stayed standing. No, you're not. Queenie pinched the bridge of her nose like she had a headache. You're a smart girl, Olive. I had a feeling you'd guess what was going on. I didn't think a frame could keep it from you for long. He told me about writing to Suki, that's all, I said. That wasn't strictly true, but I was unsure how much to say. You're learning that some things need to be kept secret. Queenie gave me a wry smile. I trust you can keep this one. I hesitated. She hadn't actually told me what the secret was, but I'd already pretty much guessed. You're expecting some people from a place that's occupied by the Germans? Yes, from France. She sat back in her chair, raking her fingers through her hair. We're bringing them here for a few days, giving them false papers, then helping them on their way again. Where will they go? To countries that aren't as strict as ours about Jewish refugees. America, Canada, Australia maybe. I thought for a moment, is what you're doing against the law? Probably. If we keep a low profile, we might just get away with it. She sighed heavily. They've got to get here first, though. It's such a risky mission. They were smuggled out of Austria all the way to the French coast, and quite frankly, they've been lucky to make it that far. We were expecting the boat ten days ago. I nodded, my mind whizzing. Day nine. The only part of Suki's note I understood. Do you know why Frame and my sister wrote to each other? I asked suddenly. What? Oh, Gloria mentioned Suki was looking for a pen pal. It was a new thing, apparently. She rolled her eyes rather dismissively. If Frame was so lonely, we both thought it might cheer him up. It certainly worked. He's quite taken with your Suki. There's more to it than that, I ventured. My sister's involved in this mission, isn't she? Queenie frowned. Your sister? Why would she be? You don't know what she's like, I replied, for it was very clear now that, that Queenie had never written to Suki, nor probably ever met her. If she had, she'd realise how much my sister hated the Nazis, how upset the news coming out of Europe made her, how headstrong and brave she was. Doing something to try and help people threatened by Hitler was exactly the sort of thing my sister would want to be part of. I couldn't understand why Queenie was so certain she wasn't. By now it was late morning. Back at the harbour I was shocked to see just how much of the lighthouse had already been painted out. High up on ladders, little figures were working so quickly that almost half of the tower was now covered in greyish brown paint. Without its red and white stripes, the lighthouse looked unrecognisable, which was the plan I knew, but it still brought a lump to my throat. It wasn't fair, this stupid war of ours. Why did everything decent and good have to suffer? It was then I noticed how far down the beach Cliff had gone, his blue coat just a speck in the distance. He was too close to the quicksand sign for my liking. As for Pixie, I couldn't see her at all. Scrambling down onto the shingle, I set off to fetch them both, which was easier said than done. The incoming tide had turned the beach into a narrow, steep strip, so I kept sliding towards the sea, then having to climb back up again, and I was soon hot and out of breath. Two hundred yards or so up ahead was the quicksand sign. I still couldn't see Pixie, only Cliff, staring over that wooden fence-type thing called a groin, Something was wrong. I started running. What are you doing here? I yelled, reaching Cliff. Where's Pixie? In answer, a dog barked. It sounded whiny and frightened. The dread I'd been fighting flooded me. You idiot, I cried. Can't you read the sign? It says quicksand. It wasn't my fault, Cliff sobbed. 
Pixie took off after a seagull. I tried to call her back. I breathed deeply, counted to ten. Just tell me where the dog is. Cliff pointed to the groin. Thankfully, a few feet beyond was a white and brown dog, at least the head, shoulders and tail of one. The tide was coming in so fast, she'd be underwater in minutes. Stand back, I ordered Cliff, right back on the safe side of the groin. I had no idea what to do next, but sounded like I did seem to do the trick. Cliff moved back onto the shingle. Rolling up my coat sleeves, I climbed up onto the groin. Beyond it, the sand was wet and rippled by the tide. I didn't trust myself to step onto it. I'd have to try and reach Pixie from here. Gripping the wood, I stretched my free arm towards the dog. Keep still, girl, I called. Nearly there. Except I wasn't. Only three measly feet of sand stood between us, but it might as well have been the Sahara. I couldn't reach her. The sand had covered her shoulders and was creeping up her neck. She'd started whining so miserably I couldn't bear it. I swung my legs over the groin. Cliff cried out. What are you doing? You can't. I'm just going to try a couple of steps, I told him. I'd read enough adventure stories to know it wasn't that simple with quicksand. But I didn't want Cliff to panic. One step in, the sand was sticky. Another step and it thickened like soup. At the third, I couldn't see my feet anymore. The sand was closing in around my ankles, my calves, all cold and clammy like porridge. Worse was how it tugged at my shoes. The harder you resisted it, the stronger it pulled. It was a horrible feeling and made me want to kick and shout and run to safety. Luckily, I didn't need to go further in. From there, I slipped my fingers through Pixie's collar. Good girl. Tried to sound normal. Are you ready? On the count of three. One, two. As I went to step backwards, my feet didn't move. Instead, my whole body lurched at the waist. Pixie gave a feeble little whine. I smoothed her head, telling her to hush. Then it was me crying, ouch, as something lashed against my leg. Wrap it round your waist, Cliff shouted. It was a decent length of rope and I was so grateful for it I could have sobbed. Not that I believed for a moment Cliff would be able to pull me out, but it had to be worth a try. With the rope tied around me, I got a firmer hold on Pixie. On the count of three, my little brother began to heave. I could hear him behind me grunting, puffing as he stepped up the beach. That's it! I yelled in encouragement. Keep going! At first, all that happened was the rope pulled tight around my waist. The pressure grew and grew till it felt like I'd be sliced through the kidneys. Just as I thought I'd be cut in half, the rope went slack. I need to catch my breath, Cliff panted. Glancing at the tide, I didn't think there was time. Let's try again, please, Cliff. Once more, the rope went tight, really tight. It dug into my ribs, burning the skin under my clothes. Go on, keep going, pull, pull, I screamed. I'm trying, Cliff yelled back. I realised Pixie's shoulders had worked free of the sand. Pull, I cried, almost hysterical. Keep pulling. It was hard to hold on to Pixie, who with a little bit of freedom was now struggling against me. I could feel my hand slipping from her collar. My legs seemed to lift beneath me. There was one enormous slurp, a huge gasp, and I fell back onto the shingle with Pixie in my arms. Breathless, Cliff flopped down beside me. Are you all right? Think so, though my arms and legs felt weak and rubbery. You were terrific. The cat's bananas, he grinned. Pajamas, dummy. I didn't want to think what would have happened without Cliff or the rope. As I untied the knot, at my waist, though, I noticed how the rest of the rope ran on up to the top of the beach as if it was tied to something else. I beckoned to Cliff, who was trying to get the worst of the sand off Pixie. Have you seen this? He hadn't. Intrigued, we followed it as it disappeared into a clump of seaweed, then reappeared a few yards on, twisting around a breakwater post. It went over driftwood, under pebbles, leading us to what looked like a large box covered in sand. Careful, Olive! Cliff cried. It might be a German mine. But kneeling down, I realised it had a handle, a leather one, and there were clips and buckles gone rusty from the seawater. It's not a mine, you great goose, I said. It's a suitcase, which, judging by the foreign words on its soggy label, had come all the way from Europe.